The term classic gets applied to a lot of different things. PB&J sandwiches are classic, John Carpenter's The Thing is a classic, Fahrenheit 451, a classic, Super Mario World, classic. When trying to look at the reasons why a thing gets called a classic though, it's generally because they passed some test of time. Regardless of how it was originally received, if something can retain a legacy after some unspecified amount of time, be critically praised, and find a connection to the present day audiences, then it is a classic. It seems like for the case of Celeste, a platform game designed by Maddie Thorson and programmed by Thorson and Noel Berry, that Celeste is now being considered a modern day classic. So what has made Celeste, a game released about a half a decade ago, a modern classic? To try and explain how or why Celeste became a modern classic, I want to guide my explanation with a quote with something that's not quite at face value related. So if it strikes you as odd, stay with me a little bit. I swear we're going to navigate through the woods metaphors straight back to the concretes of Celeste. But anyways, what makes Celeste a modern day classic are the same things that make a country song a classic. It's three chords and the truth. When you look at country music and its sister genres of folk music or bluegrass or whatever, you find a lot of the same stuff. During my free time, I go to a handful of open mics in the city that I live in, and let me tell you, almost everyone is doing the same thing. I don't want to seem rude or dismissive, but vastly the majority of open mic performances that I've gone to are nothing new, and they're kind of mediocre. Smelly cat, smelly cat, what are they feeding you? I can't count how many times I've heard songs use the same 1-4-5 chord pattern. However, I love open mics, in part because you'll eventually find someone who plays the same three chords, but it has something extra. Call it soul, call it feel, call it truth, call it whatever you want. The fact that there's sometimes someone that can play those chords in a way that just hits different. It's almost magical in some kind of way, and it's not to be explained easily. It's something that's felt. And this whole YouTube video is me trying to explain something very similar that's happening with the game of Celeste and that because it does this, it is rightly considered a modern day classic. Celeste, as you might already know, is a platformer game, which is one of the most common games out there. For example, in 2008, the same year that Celeste came out, we also had Owlboy, The Messenger, Dandara, and Gris all come out at the same time. These games are good, and some of these games are great, but I don't think people are calling them classics in the same way that people are calling Celeste a modern day classic. So the parallel that I'm making here is that in the same way that a lot of songs use the same chord patterns, but only a few of them become classics, there are a lot of platformer games, but very few endure the test of time and have the same soul that is found in Celeste. So to speak metaphorically here for a moment, what is the formula Celeste used to get its three chords and its truth? Well, I think it includes at least three things. The story, the potential utilized in the speedrunning community, and the methodology of feeling. Let's start with the story and talk about the other two next. The story of Celeste is based on a young woman named Madeline and her journey to climb Mount Celeste. Climbing the mountain, as you quickly discover, plays both a literal physical goal, but also serves as the classic climbing the mountain metaphor. Madeline struggles in both a physical, but also allegorical one, when climbing the mountain symbolizes her internal struggle. The exact nature of this internal struggle is never explicitly spelled out in the dialogues of Celeste. Although there are moments where things become more explicit, it's safe to say that one of the widest overarching themes of Celeste is one of mental health. Self-loathing, regret, sorrow, etc. are all applicable narratives that players often see themselves easily placed into the structure that Celeste presents. Whatever the exact struggle is that the player has read into Celeste, the allegorical conflict as it turns out isn't one about Madeline versus the protagonist, or another, but instead is about Madeline struggling with herself. By the time Madeline scales the Mountain of Celeste, she has overcome the struggle and accepted and acknowledged a fuller or wholer sense of self. This struggle can be naturally seen as having queer undertones, and this is, as it turns out, no coincidence. Maddie Thorson, a trans woman herself, has explained, If the discourse around Celeste hadn't become so focused on queer undertones, I don't think I would have come out publicly for a long time. But I don't regret how I came out. I think there are a lot of values in the confirmation that yes, Celeste is a trans story in addition to its broader relatability. With this context, we can read the story of Celeste as an allegorical one that Maddie herself was experiencing with her feelings around gender while coding and writing Celeste. Maddie herself also says, So maybe if you're a cis person and you personally relate to Madeline, you shouldn't feel like we pulled one over on you. Instead, you should see this as evidence that the trans and cis feelings aren't so different that the chasm between transness and cisness isn't a wide gulf. 
This is 100% on the money. The strokes of the paintbrush that Celeste's story paint are one that both trans and cis folks can relate to. Because the struggles are, at the end of the day, ones that are grounded in human experience. No matter what walk of life or nature of how you identify, we all struggle within ourselves. That struggle with oneself is a universal, relatable feature that makes Celeste's story something that all audiences can get something out of. And as Maddie puts it, if you got something out of Celeste, and now you're thinking that Madeline being trans ruins that for you, I would take that as a sign that you have some transphobic beliefs to work through. And with that, we'll move on to the second chord, or subject matter, of this material, and that's the speed running potential of Celeste. When we talked about some of the properties of being a classic, we mentioned the passage of time. For games that have set stories and limited variations between start and end, this could seem like a hard thing to achieve. How? For example, can you make saving the princess or incinerating personality cores of a super intelligent computer system something that people want to do over and over and over for years to come? You're not a good person. You know that, right? Well, as it turns out, people will love doing those things over and over and over for years to come if you can provide the tools for them to continually find better and faster ways of doing that. As of making this video, Celeste is consistently on the top five of the most popular speedrun games at speedrun.com. The reasons that Celeste is such a popular game for the speedrunning community are really coming down to a handful of things. Madeline, for example, is extremely responsive to commands, and while her inputs are few, there are many nuances in the combinations of those controls and the level of precision about the timing of their inputs that allow for some truly incredible things to come from an individual player. The vocabulary for Celeste speedrunners have grown to account for all these specified nuances and combinations, like super dash, extended dash, hyper dash, whatever. Even with all these new things though, the game still has the virtue of being able to let the player have their own style and create a solution. So while the skill cap for the speedrunner is very high, the goal of the game, getting to the top of the mountain, is also very simple for viewers to digest. So with the goal being simple, and the various paths and ways you can solve it being limited to only the player's creativity, and given how creativity is humankind's best trait, it's nearly unlimited and extremely cool to watch. Additionally, the open nurturing environment that the Celeste community generally has makes it so that even these extremely high skill ceilings are something that folks who are new to speedrunning are warmly welcome to. Whether it's Discord channels, subreddits, or YouTube videos, viewing or participating in the Celeste speedruns are very approachable. So to tie a ribbon on this part of the video, it's all this utilized potential of Celeste as a speedrunning game that helped contribute to cementing Celeste's legacy as a classic. Lastly, the third reason why Celeste is such a classic, I would argue, is in the way that it was created. More specifically, it was created on a focus of general feeling as opposed to specific calculations. I got this feeling and methodology from Maddie and Noel's approach really from two different interviews which I'll link in the description below. During these interviews, they mentioned a few different times that the development strategy of Celeste was a process of iteration, not calculation. Instead of collecting and analyzing things on death counts or locations, they simply invited friends over to play their game and watch them. If they noticed that something didn't quite feel right, they would tweak it and adjust the code and have them play again. What they were aiming for then was not necessarily something explicit, like getting players from the start to the end within a certain amount of time without a certain amount of deaths, but simply that the feel of their movements had good flow, and that whether or not they ended in success or failure always felt natural. This is what I mean when I say the development of Celeste had a methodology of feeling. Maddie and Noel were focused on the visceral and emotional experience of Celeste and iterated on the game live until it felt right. Once they had gone through this methodology and converged upon a quintessential feeling that is so crucial to Madeline's movements, the rest was up to the players themselves to express themselves in the palette they had been given. This openness and focus on feeling, I would argue, is one of the greatest reasons that Celeste has endured to this day. At face value, Celeste is just a platformer game. One of many, and platform games are so numerous nowadays one could wrongly assume that Celeste itself is a dime a dozen. But just like there are tons of folks playing those same three or four chords to a song, but every so often you find someone who plays those chords with more soul and feeling in a way that makes you want to come back and listen to it over and over and over, Celeste has given us a platformer game with three or four simple inputs that have more soul and feeling than any other platformer game I've played, and it's one that I find myself coming back to over and over and over. The dialogue around Celeste is as lively as ever, and new mods like Strawberry Jam are still being released. With all these signs, I can confidently agree with the folks on the internet calling Celeste a modern day classic, because as far as I can tell, Celeste really is passing the test of time. And what else is a classic besides that? Either way, thanks for watching this video, I appreciate you, and I'll catch you next time.